want to keep this fairly short, but this is one of our um, neuro-ophthalmology presentations that we are required to do as residents, and so I believe this would be my last. Correct? Yay, good. Um, I'm really excited, actually, to present this particular case because it is neuro-ophthalmology related, um, but it was kind of um, the residents putting their heads together to figure this out um, in our general clinic at the VA, so pretty proud of this. Um, so I entitled this Diagnostic Confusion, and you'll see in a second why, why I entitled it that way. So this was a 68-year-old male veteran who, again, was seen at the VA and general clinic, first presenting with uh, double vision and uh, a little bit after the onset of that with a droopy eyelid. As far as the history, two weeks prior to his presentation, he had the uh, sudden onset of binocular diplopia, which he described as constant, and then a week after that, the uh, droopy left upper eyelid uh, started to uh, bother him. On the day of exam, he mentioned that the diplopia itself had gotten worse, where the images were described as being farther apart from each other than they had previously been. Um, he had some significant things on his past medical history, namely diabetes, hypertension, uh, corneal artery disease, sleep apnea, some thyroid um, issues as well, hyperparathyroid as well, and he also had metastatic renal uh, cancer for which he had a nephrectomy uh, performed as well as an adrenalectomy. He had also had um, a significant heart surgery in the past as well. Regarding his diabetes, he did have proliferative diabetic retinopathy status post, a PRP, uh, focal laser as well. He also had both eyes vitrectomized. He had cataract surgery done in both eyes and uh, a YAG in the right eye. Um, social history, being in the military, he was exposed to Agent Orange, uh, but he did not uh, claim to have, uh, have any uh, tobacco, alcohol, or drug use in the past. He was on insulin and Synthroid. Um, as far as his review of sim uh, symptoms, just simply he denied any dysphagia in the past or any breathing problems, dysarthria, or muscle weakness. These were some of the specific questions that we were uh, trying to ascertain, or answers that we were trying to ascertain in our uh, exam with him. Vision-wise, he had very poor vision in both eyes, um, as you can see there, and that was basically due to his proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Pupils, he did not have an afferent pupil, pupillary defect, um, and there was no anisocoria either. Um, his extraocular movements um, as is shown here, showed decreased superduction of the right eye, um, but uh, similar in all other directions. Because of his poor visual acuity, we were not able to do a cross cover or um, alternate cover testing on him. Um, so instead, we did a single Maddox rod just to try to pull out some of the subtle subtleties in this. And we noted that he had in primary gaze a right hypertropia which improved in left gaze and were similar in both head tilts to either side. But in up gaze, um, it seemed to change to a left hyper. And so right there, it was pretty confusing trying to figure out what's going on with his extraocular movements. He also has a droopy eyelid. So we did measurements of his ptosis. Um, I have a picture that I'll show you in just a second. He had left uh, ptosis. And you can see the differences in all of our eyelid measurements uh, that uh, the, the ptosis was significant on the left side. We also tested a Kogan's lid twitch, which was negative. There was no fatigability on exam either. Um, on slit and examination, we didn't note that he had posterior uh, chamber eye wells placed. Um, and on uh, dilated fundus exam, also we saw the PRP laser scars and other focal scars. So as far as our differential diagnosis, um, just real quickly, we thought that um, it wasn't uh, you know, significant or, or kind of pointing towards a fourth cranial nerve palsy, but it might be a pupil sparing third nerve palsy possibly um, with his diabetes um, history. Graves disease, we know that he did have some thyroid issues Myasthenia gravis was also on the differential and a skew deviation. So this is a picture of him, as you can see, significant uh, droopy upper lid on the left side. 
And so trying to put all this together and summarize it, we noted that this patient had a sudden onset of changes, both with diplopia as well as the lid changes that seemed to fluctuate a little bit, becoming more constant over time, um, diplopia getting worse over time as well. He didn't seem to have any uh, proptosis either um, on exam, but um, so what we decided to do was an ice test on him. We said, well, let's just try it and see what happens. So this is pre-ice ice test, and two minutes after applying the ice, that's what he looked like. That's a pretty significant change, and uh, we were all pretty excited about that. I don't think I've ever seen an ice test as positive as this, but um, again, I haven't done a whole lot of ice tests either in the past, but this was um, literally pointing to the one differential diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. And so that became the top of our list. And as a result, we did send him for a lab testing. Specifically, we looked at the acetylcholine receptor antibodies, which was elevated, as you can see in the parentheses, that would be the normal range, so it's 1.73. We also tested his uh, thyroid panel, which all seemed to be uh, within the normal range. And as uh, per protocol, when you're trying to diagnose or look into or evaluate myasthenia gravis, we also sent him for a CT to looking, looking for a thymoma which was negative on imaging. So uh, just a brief overview. This was a great test, a uh, great case for the residents to kind of confirm what we have learned about dealing with uh, myasthenia gravis. It is an autoimmune disorder, uh, the hallmark of which is weakness that seems to improve with rest. And pathophysiology-wise, it is due to immune complexes that block the acetylcholine receptor decreasing the neurotransmission at the neuromuscular junction. 90% um, of patients will present with ocular um, problems, and so it's not uncommon for ophthalmologists to be involved right at the onset and maybe even do uh, come up with the initial diagnosis. Uh, ptosis is the most common sign, but diplopia is also fairly common as well. The diplopia issue can mimic a number of different um, uh, problems. It can mimic uh, any of the cranial nerves. More commonly, a sixth nerve palsy or partial pupil sparing third. Um, it can also mimic an I INO or a total ophthalmoplegia, um, as well as gaze palsies, or it might even uh, mimic an isolated muscle palsy, like an inferior oblique. Um, orbicularis oculi weakness can also be found on exam, but it will not have or involve uh, pupils. As we all know, myasthenia gravis is not um, always just an ocular type of disease. Uh, systemic findings uh, can also be involved or found, including weakness in other muscle groups in the body. Um, the, the muscles used in chewing, neck, trunk, even limbs. Dysphagia, hoarseness, dysarthria, and dyspnea can also be um, indications of systemic involvement as well. Thyroid eye disease uh, can also be associated with uh, myasthenia gravis in about 5% of these patients. So as you can see, uh, you know, with exam findings, the way the patient uh, may present, it can often lead to confusion and trying to sort out what is, what is true, what, uh, what might be um, actually related to myasthenia gravis or possibly something else. But again, the hallmark that we noted in our case, and, and we should keep in mind, is that there is fluctuation and fatigability um, involved. So on exam, we need to always check pupils and make sure that it is not involving pupils. If the pupils are involved, we need to start thinking about something else on our differential rather than myasthenia gravis. Eyelid measurements and proptosis, as we, as we looked into, extraocular movements. Uh, trying to get a pattern, if there is such a pattern. Um, testing the strength of the orbicularis oculi muscles, having the patient squeeze really tight and trying to actually open up manually their eyelids. Um, testing for a Kogan's lid twitch, I think uh, many of us have done this, and basically it's just eliciting um, a saccade from down gaze to primary gaze or up gaze to see if there is an overshoot of uh, the upper totic eyelid. Um, after which you'll, you'll notice that the, the lid will kind of settle back down to its totic state. Fatigability can also be tested in the clinic where you'll have the patient in sustained up gaze and you'll notice that uh, the totic lid will become 
more tautic. Um, enhancement of uh, the ptosis as well. If you lift the more tautic eyelid manually, you'll notice that the other eyelid will actually drop. Um, and that is in uh, accordance to Herring's law. You can also do these other tests in the, uh, in the clinic, namely a Tensilon test. We weren't about to do this at the VA. I'm glad we didn't. But um, you can administer adrophonium by IV. You need to make sure that you have atropine on board because it can cause bradycardia and other issues. Um, <coughs> but uh, you can also do a sleep test, which again is a, a very easy test to do. You have the patient sleep for about 30 minutes and uh, see if their ptosis or extraocular movements improve. And as we did in our clinic, uh, the ICE test, very easy test to do, it only takes about two minutes and you can see the effect that we got in this patient. Um, lab tests, uh, the binding antibody is the more common test to do. It's found in, in about 90% of patients with general uh, myasthenia gravis and 50% with ocular myasthenia gravis. Um, you can also test for the blocking antibody as well as the modulating antibody. You can also test for the, uh, the musk antibody. And usually that is done if the suspicion is still high but the, uh, the other antibodies are negative. And uh, as we did, we should also test for thyroid as well because of uh, the possible association. Single fiber EMG uh, can also be done. It's the most sensitive for myasthenia gravis and you would see a characteristic uh, decremental response with repeated stimuli, um, a, as well as doing a, a CT scan for a thymoma, which can occur in about 10% of patients. Treatment-wise, our patient ended up being put on mestinon, um, but you can also use corticosteroids and other immunosuppressant medications. Um, for the eye problems, prisms, patching, ptosis crutches, I've never seen those, but I've seen pictures of them. They seem to help with the, uh, the droopy eyelid. Um, and even strabismus surgery um, can be offered if needed. A thymectomy, if a, a thymoma is present, also makes sense. Short-term treatment would include IVIG and plasmapheresis. Now, um, about 85% of patients with just ocular symptoms will tend to develop systemic findings over um, two years. But uh, as we did with our patient, we got our patient involved in neurology as well as neuro-ophthalmology, we plugged him into the clinic and he also was sent to the neuromuscular clinic for further management as well. I just wanted to thank Dr. Warner and uh, Grant Marchetti, who uh, we worked together on this case. Thank you very much. Any questions? Great, it's a good review. Thank you. <laughs>